here we are. We are about to let uh, uh, participants into our Zoom webinar. Uh, oh, here. Hello, Francesco. And we have a special guest again this week, and we're really delighted to have Gabriela Lins with us. Hello, Gabriela. Hi, hello. Hi, thank you for joining us, Gabriela. So thank you so much for inviting me. Francesco. Absolutely. We're, we're, we're starting in just uh, 30 seconds. We're just letting people join. Uh, and a reminder, people from home, you've joined uh, Zooming in our weekly curatorial conversations from the Magnus with, uh, with Sher Galko Javi. Hi, Shir. Hi. <laughs> and with Francesco Spagnolo, that's me. And this <laughs> is uh, presented by the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life and at UC Berkeley College of Letters and Science, the Division of Art and Humanities as part of the Arts and Ideas Live Online. We've been producing a lot of live and online content over the, since the summer, since the late summer. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, a few rules of engagement before we get started with our conversation today. Uh, this is a, a reminder that this is a Zoom webinar. And uh, so you can use the chat. There is a, there is a button at the chat uh, uh, at the at the bottom of your screen, uh, and you can you can send us uh, technical questions. Also, we appreciate hearing where, where you're zooming in from because we can't see you. you. You see us, but we cannot see you from home. So it's good to to hear where you're from. And the chat is expertly managed by our young colleagues, uh, Ross Calter, uh, who's an undergraduate student at UC Berkeley. And thank you, Ross, for being with us. We don't see him; he's not on video, but he's very much behind the scene managing the whole thing. If you have any questions about what we're going to present, instead you want to use the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar. Again, at the bottom of your screen, you should find a couple of balloons and a Q&A uh, icon. And so click there and ask away. And at the end of our presentation, we will be uh, trying as always to answer your questions. We don't, we can't answer every question right here. But we try. No, but today we have a guest and hopefully yes. we can put her on some of the questions. And of course, <laughs> we'll you can always reach us at magnus at berkeley.edu and uh, please visit the website magnus.berkeley.edu. It has a lot of content, a lot of images, images of Gabriela's work. And uh, so as we start today, old craft and new media, we're really devoting uh, this conversation to Gabriela's uh, uh, Betzalel inspired Leaning Tower series. We've talked a bit about Betzalel Shira and Tretinas yes. a few weeks ago. Uh, I think it was a few weeks, maybe a few I months. I think it was know. probably last time month, flies. but yeah. uh, time does fly nowadays. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And so we, we discussed uh, the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts and, uh, and uh, started exploring an exhibition that's currently at the Magnus, although not, not on view because the Magnus is closed to the public. And in that exhibition are two works by Gabriella. So we're going to uh, learn more about Gabriella. We've, we've had other guests on this uh, show, including an artist that, that shares a similar uh, trajectory in terms of her collaboration with, uh, uh, with the Magnus, uh, just like Gabriella. Also, Nikki Green was a student in the uh, uh, art practice program uh, and uh, got an MFA from, from UC Berkeley. And, um, and so we collaborated during their student years. And uh, just like Nikki, uh, the, the, these materials are uh, augmenting the, the, the holdings of the magnet. So we create exhibitions, we create projects together. Uh, we love to involve students in our work. And we do work, Shir knows this very well, but people from home probably know this very well. We do work with students every day of the week. We have a, a, a pretty active internship and uh, it's, uh, it's not just fun, it's, it's vital to, our, to our, the way we work because we need to see the Magnus Collection, one of the largest Jewish Museum collections in the world, uh, through the eyes of our uh, of our students. We need to understand it in completely different ways. So, uh, Gabriella's intervention in, in our exhibition is both that of a student and, of course, that of an artist. And uh, and we 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 like to think about it in both in both uh, ways. Of course, Gabriella has since graduated, so you uh, I don't know, Gabriella, if you're past being a student, uh, or whether you're you know it's a lifelong. Uh, kind of project, but uh, but we're going to hear about about uh, you and about your uh, really incredible works uh, uh, that were added to, and we see them on, on on the screen that were added to our exhibition on display at the Magnus. So we're exploring with Sheer the background of the exhibition that was called Souvenirs from Utopia. Uh, good title, 
and um, and then we're going to learn about Gabriela's uh, work and uh, and trajectory as an artist between Israel and the United States, United States and Israel, and uh, the web memory objects, all kinds of uh, ideas. And uh, then we're focusing really on the specific objects, the souvenirs in the in the exhibition, and how uh, um, Gabriela intervened in in our project and in dialogue with the collection itself. Uh, does this sound like a plan? I hope so with uh, both of you. I'm going to let you lead the way now. So I'll be your humble uh, uh, slideshow uh, runner. So just uh, tell me if you need to go back, forth, et cetera. I'll be there uh, uh, walking through this with you. Thank you, Francesco. That was perfect. And I think we're ready to, to dive in. So we'll start by uh, quickly introducing uh, the exhibition Souvenirs from Utopia opened last year in 2019 at the Magnus. And there it is. Uh, there is our uh, our gallery hall uh, near the entrance, which we miss so dearly. And you can also see it behind me, although it's only virtual for me right now. Um, and this exhibition, exhibition was really inspired by a research that we started on our in our collection, as most exhibitions do at the Magnus, um, by looking at objects that arrived from, that were created at the Bet the School of Arts and Crafts that uh, was established in Jerusalem at the turn of the century in 1906 by the uh, the artist Boris Schatz, which uh, if you look back at our talks, I'm sure you'll, you can hear more about him. Um, and the exhibition was really dedicated to the idea of the, the crafts uh, that were created in that school. While the, it was obviously an art school, there were arts and crafts uh, happening at the same time. There were artisans and artists working together and working in parallel as well. And here we saw that there were numerous objects that were really created for the tourist art markets uh, to raise money uh, to allow this school to continue existing, to allow uh, more students to come to Palestine at the time and study at the school and they were distributed all over the world in different exhibitions and so on. And many of them, of course, arrived to the United States and ended up in our collection at the Magnus. So we divided, um, we divided the, the, the theme of the exhibition, Souvenirs from Utopia, into, six, into our six cases and into six topics. And we started it by looking at the artistic legacy of trauma by thinking of the pogroms of uh, Eastern Europe and how they really uh, caused many, many artists and many and many Jews to flee Europe and, and, and immigrate to Palestine eventually, and how it was really also one of the reasons and one of the causes for the development of many of the national movements and, and the Zionist movements specifically. And then we moved into looking at the land of Israel as a more, modern biblical utopia, which is what you see uh, on your left there um, with this beautiful carpet that we also discussed in a nice presentation that Francesco mentioned. Um, and look and got more specifically into looking at oriental fashion and the minority crafts, uh, women and men at the Patel School and, and what they what women were doing, what women were responsible for, what men were responsible for at Batel, the typical um, uh, you know, issue or the people who were already living in Jerusalem at the time and what kind of work they did. There was a big Yemenite community living around Jerusalem at the time, and they were they were involved in the in very specific uh, art crafts, uh, like for example, silver and gold filigree work, which you'll, we'll see later. And then we looked at Boris Schatz, the founder of the school who was an artist and at early Zionist uh, voices. And of course, all kinds of concepts that derive from it and ended by with looking at this beautiful vitrine, this beautiful display here, which really gives you a general idea, especially when you can stand in front of it. And unfortunately this photo probably doesn't do it justice. Um, of the different um, objects that were created, the different materials, a variety of materials, and also how the Batel School uh, evolved. And you can see that in the posters from different departments, uh, different new media that was introduced in Batel after the State of Israel was established and Batel became the, the Academy of Batel, eventually that still exists in Jerusalem. Um, and then on the bottom here uh, of the screen, I marked it in blue and I hope you can see it, are the two works, uh, the Leaning Tower series uh, that, Gab that Gabriela uh, created so beautifully for us, which we'll discuss in a, just momentarily. So before we get into that, I'm going to go backwards now, uh, and these are the two works, and introduce you to, to the beautiful Gabriela Villas, who is joining us here uh, today. And it's such a treat to have her um, 
And I, I'm sorry, I'm already outing you. So Gabby was feeling a little ill this week and I'm very pleased that we can do this today with her. Um, and hopefully you will understand from her voice that she's much, much better, but she had a bit of a cold a uh, few days ago. So Gabriela Willens works in photography, video and art installation, critically exploring how knowledge is constructed. She lives and works between the United States and Israel, and in 2019 earned her MFA, a Master of Fine Art, from the University of California, Berkeley. Her work has been exhibited in numerous galleries in Israel and California, among them the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, uh, Root Division in San Francisco, the California Lieutenant Governor's Office in Sacramento. And please join me in learning a little more about her fascinating and very complex work sometimes. So, um, Gabby, when we were first introduced, uh, there was this work of yours that you created in 2018. And every time we talk, I go back to it because it was such a unique and such a fantastic work. And I just felt so closely to it, which was a sound installation called A Monument to All Those Times Everything Didn't Happen. And if you want, I'm going to invite you to tell us a few words about it. But before we get into that, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your personal bio, your personal transition, because you actually started working in theater. You actually started in a very, from a very performative uh, world and transitioned into an, an art, uh, into the art world, into the different visual art world. So if you could just kind of explain it to us a little bit and, and I'm more than happy to also allow you to get into your works uh, that we're seeing here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and, and yes, uh, for explaining this, um, my voice that is a little harsh. Um, thank you so much, Sharon Francesco, for inviting me also to make the work um, last year for Souvenirs and Utopia and also to speak here today. Um, as Sharon said, or Francesco said, I've been living and working in between Israel and the, and the States. And as Sharon just said, I, my background is in performance arts. I did a lot of theater, both as a director and a divisor, so writing and um, very little acting. And although I transitioned into visual arts, I think that I that it's, um, I'm always looking at visual arts and creating through this lens of narrative, not necessarily story, but more narrative, which means to me, I mean, it's a, it's a word that has maybe, can be understood in many ways. To me, it means the accumulation of information and how bringing different aspects together creates a more, um, or different layers always kind of contradicts and deepens and widens the, the picture and the perspective. So narrative is always this kind of, um, layering and broadening of any of any moment, and um, and a lot of my work in the visual um, realm is still very much working um, on sets and location with theatrical means, props, actors. Um, these in this in the image we see here, these are uh, non-actors, but I employed them as actors. Um, Maybe and you can tell us a little bit about this scene, and we can get yeah. further into it. So, so I don't know if we have time to talk about um, the, uh, the project you you uh, brought up, uh, um, the sound installation, but maybe at the end we can get back to it. I, I brought here two um, projects, one this, both of them through 2019, one from Israel and one from the US. Um, this project, Urban Combat Training Facility, um, what's important was shot and um, produced in Israel and it's a video and a series of photographs and what's most kind of important to um, to know or to understand um, if we can maybe go back to the to the previous image is that this um, the location where they're at is a urban combat training facility um, which means that it's a fake town it's built by the military in in Israel um, kind of to resemble a uh, Arab or a Palestinian town so that the um, soldiers can uh, train in uh, an ex as, as much as possible in exact environment and to be kind of um, well prepared for whatever they might encounter in, in a real um, combat. Um, so I was, I'm fascinated by this kind of strategy that, that is all over the world, all over the world, there's these kind of fake towns for, to, to train in. Um, and then I asked uh, that all of them were in the uh, Israeli army but are not currently serving to kind of act out that part of a, of a soldier civilian. And um, I think, I hope it's quite clear that this is a very staged photograph. It's not a documentary of, of any training. Um, 
I think it's quite clear from the kind of choreographed positioning of the men. And I tried to capture this moment of uh, uh, liminality in between, kind of reflecting on um, a very uh, painful subject uh, uh, to me as a as an Israeli person that um, uh, the fact that Israel. Um, uh, army service is mandatory in Israel means that all kind of all citizens and civilians go through this process of uh, militarization. So these men here are caught in between um, between being a civilian codes from civilian mm -hmm. to uh, military. Yeah, yeah, and it's not clear they're putting on the military or taking off the military, and I think that's kind of um, where we are. Mm -hmm, um, that transition and these transitions are also very are kind of are not a transition obviously between the army and being a civilian but between but just transitions and changes are kind of something that really defines a, a at least a part of your life and the, now that you're living here in the united states there has been a dialogue i think in terms of your work between the life in israel the life in the united states how you interpret certain things and maybe the next work is could be a good example for that. So please walk us yeah. through it. Um, so all, I think both these projects kind of deal with questions of uh, home and structures of uh, domesticity um, with or how they kind of uh, the recipro reciprocity between them and structures of homeland and larger national institutions. In this work that I did here in the US, um, I casted four actors to portray a family, a father, a mother, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And we, um, I wrote a script for three kind of mundane scenes, a breakfast scene, um, the parents playing with the kids and uh, the father putting the young kid to sleep and reading a story. And we rehearsed with the actors through these kind of scenes with their um, normal, let's say, uh, dialogue. And then I replaced all the dialogue with uh, direct quotations from uh, more of the canonical U.S. kind of um, texts from political speeches, from Hollywood films, from um, from children books. C can we, do we have time to see the two minutes? Maybe we'll just see uh, one minute or a snippet oh, from the part. video because I don't know that we have enough time today for, uh, for, the, for the video. What it looks like. Americans are asking who attacked us. The best information we have is a loosely connected- Terrorist organizations known as Al-Qaeda. Their leaders had our freedom. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't take that off. Americans should not expect one battle but a lengthy campaign. Unlike any they have ever seen? It may include dramatic strikes. No, we don't make policy here. Gentlemen, elected officials, civilians do that. We are the instruments of that policy. And although we are not at war, we have to act as we are at the war. Maybe we can stop right here. Um, thank you, Gabby. Americans are asking who attacked uh, us. The best information. There. there we go. Yeah, and just to uh, thank you, Gabby. That was fantastic, and I'm really looking forward to getting back to you with that, with this new project you're working on in a few minutes, um, hopefully we'll have enough time. So just to get back to our topic and to Gabby's uh, beautiful project, Cleaning Towers, which was really the main theme of, of this presentation today and a very significant, although small physically, part of the, the Souvenirs from Utopia exhibition, because it really changes the, the concept uh, and it really changes an outlook on these objects that we, were, that we were putting on display for the exhibition, objects that were created in Jerusalem between uh, 1906, let's say, and the 1920s uh, by these artisans who learned at the school and became these very um, fine, very, uh, very, well, I would say successful, but very, um, since they weren't well known for the, their names, but they were known for their craft. So these very um, highly, highly um, sensitive artists and artisans who created these beautiful woodworks that are all handmade with the uh, local wood, local uh, olive wood sometimes, and these beautiful uh, pieces made of silver, of um, gold, covered in gold leaf sometimes, um, which you see that are also inspired obviously by, by different movements that were happening in the art world at the same time. And as you will see momentarily, these beautiful, very delicate artworks created at the Batilla Art School at the turn of the century, uh, really uh, demonstrate a very specific period of time and a very specific specific type of craftsmanship that Gabi really uh, 
was inspired by it, but also drifted as far away from as possible, one might say. So Gabi, let's let's look at your project at these objects which were really very that are very similar by the way of, they look to the original Betalal items, but then of course. Please tell us uh, what inspired you and how you see this difference between the two types of, of materials and, and works. Um, so I was really, when, when we started working on this, I was really interested in how you, what you told me about the objects that they were, first of all, they're part of the Magnus collection. So they're already kind of infused with this value of, it, of a thing worthwhile um, curating and holding and um, uh, they get that kind of glamour. But um, their original uh, making and functioning done under an art school, but as objects to be sold and craftsmanship. And also you told me um, that they were done by the kind of either female women or maybe other minorities and they yeah. were not uh, really evaluated as great works of art. Mm -hmm. And I was yes. interested in that kind of um, dichotomy and also how uh, something can change its value through context. So we decided to approach and make a, a fine art um, object that now is also part of the Magnus collection. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. <laughs> we love having them. We miss them, we miss them dearly. <laughs> um, and that, but then we decided to kind of translate that tension between high and low into a modern context. So we, uh, I, I decided to um, use the process of um, photogrammetry and 3D modeling and 3D printing to kind of um, replicate that tension. So what we see in this image here, um, we went to the, um, we, the, the map. or we, we had the objects scan 3D, um, the 360 degree photos. Um, you can't touch them. It's all kind of very computerized. And um, then we created a, uh, 3D model that you see here kind of from, I couldn't um, upload a, um, the file where you can actually move it. So I put just some still images, but it's a really unique kind of technique where you can actually create um, a physical object, a 3D model. And, and of course it's all digital here. I just want to stress how there's no hand that was really involved, no physical hand that was really involved in touching these objects. It's, all it's interesting, even when we touched the, object, the objects, we had to wear gloves. It was before <laughs> COVID, so that kind of struck me. Um, and then uh, the, um, the wine cup, we, I printed in earth clay, and which is very, very cool at UC Berkeley. Um, at the ceramics department, they have a, a clay printer. And um, you can see even on top here, that little kind of um, blemish. Um, we left a few of the blemishes. You left them on purpose. Totally on purpose because, and I was thinking just the other day, kind of like about that name, Leaning Tower, where the value and the importance comes out from what is unique, what is you can't kind of really control and you can't replace. And with, um, with printing, with products, obviously the idea is to always have consistency and the same exact quality. But when we're talking about a handmade object or a work of art, it's that exact uniqueness that you can't replicate. So I think those object uh, moments of failure, what we would call, or the leaning or the, maybe if we can go to the next image of, um, of the menorah that I printed out in, uh, in plastic, which is considered a very, um, and definitely not silver, not something, it's it's not expensive to, to purchase and to print with. That's why I um, kind of utilized. Um, but we, I also printed it very, very thin. It's, that's something you can't see here. You can see it when it was on display in the Magnus because there was a mirror behind, but it's very, very, very thin. So it also becomes a really delicate object that kind of you have to handle with care and with gloves. Um, and you can see with the, the little candle holders that there's these holes. It was quite challenging to create a thing that is almost falling apart, but it is sturdy enough to, to <laughs> Yeah, and you put it so beautifully in the in the text that you wrote for the exhibition. So I'll just read um, a couple of, of, uh, of these sentences that, that we marked. The series Leaning Towers highlights the tensions inherent to the original objects between art and craft, the decorative and the conceptual, fine arts and functional product. The one of a kind quality associated with handmade objects 
is, re is replaced in these replicas with the unpredictable failures, the beautiful blemishes and faded results that occur due to the, the, to the mediation of the 3D printing process and the translation between materials and media, suggesting failure as the maker or marker of value presents us with the opportunity to rethink our various hierarchies, the ones that are outlined above uh, that I just mentioned. So you really, I think, uh, encompass the whole concept uh, very beautifully. And uh, I wish we could have a little more time to discuss it. But since we're just about to end, I really wanted to invite you to give us maybe a quick pick, pick into your, your new project, because once again, it really resonates with so much of what we're doing at the Magnus and the concept of memory and objects. Yeah. Just in one sentence, this is a project I'm, I'm currently working on. Um, it's a much larger project, which I'm going to also be, I'm working with Berkeley Rep and we're replicating these objects um, that are from my personal um, uh, inheritance from my grandmother. Um, I'm making them as props and I'm gonna be working with actors, but just this, this image, which I call um, an incomplete portrait is um, really looking at both the, the objects I inherited and how they kind of reflect and are in dialogue with um, social political um, understandings that I inherited, who I became and how I understand the world, kind of looking how that kind of mimics or has um, conversation with the actual objects that we have and that we um, accumulate in our life and in our tradition and lifetimes in a sentence. Thank you, Gabby. And I know that you invited other people to participate in part of that project. So I want to invite our guests to learn more about Gabby and her works online and hopefully also on our website. And uh, thank you, Gabby. This was fascinating. And you know, next time we'll need a longer presentation from you with more examples. Uh, but maybe we can uh, see if there are some questions uh, from, the, from the audience. And just as a reminder, if um, Anybody wants to send us questions, please use the Q&A button in the, on the bottom of your screens. Or if you have any technical difficulties uh, or want to tell us where you're located today and where you're zooming in to us from, uh, please use the chat button on the bottom of your screen. So let's see. While we wait for some questions to come in, Gabi, uh, if you can uh, just tell us, how long have you been living in the US for? I, uh, I lived here as a, as a young child, so uh, for uh, four years back as a preschooler, and then um, I did a couple of years here as a young adult in New York, and now we moved here. I moved here with my family three years ago. Um, yeah, and we've been living for three years. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you feel this has shifted your practice, uh, uh, changing locations? Um, I think... Uh, that's a big, that's, it's a complicated question to answer. I think that- It was meant to be complicated to answer. So. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm all the time looking at the issues that are in concern to myself, but they're always kind of broader communal, political, social questions. And I was dealing a lot with subject matters that are very kind of Israel-based, uh, the IDF and the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the occupation uh, processes of, social, of socialization and indoctrination there. And I felt that something is lost in translation when they're kind of decoded and understand and, and um, observed here in the, in the US. There's something I think about that specific region that is so um, uh, full of tension and everybody feels maybe because it's a lot on the news that they, that they know and they're not really, some of my feelings, not everybody of course, but that there was not enough room to engage in the conversation and, and um, some people wanted more uh, concrete um, statements, which is less kind of the work I do. So I, um, I've been working more on subjects matters that are kind of more, uh, I guess, US or, or, um, or local or, in, or global, perhaps. So I think the subject matter has changed a bit. Um, but I hope that that my approach of um, trying to trying to shed light or decode or uncode or look at um, processes of, um, of how we understand the world, how we become who we are. Um, yeah. Well, you know, my impression, I remember meeting you, you had pretty much just arrived at UC Berkeley uh, right. when we first met and you're still you. So <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can attest to that. Um, thank you so much, 
Gabi, and thank you, Shir, for, for leading us through this uh, fascinating conversation. Um, we're, we're back. Which reaction? What was the reaction like? And how do we read this painting and this painting in particular? Will be will be our topic for next week. So uh, you can Join go us. to our website and uh, magnus.berkeley.edu and register for the upcoming presentations. And uh, once again, uh, oh, actually we have yeah, we one, just have one, one, question, one question, so we yes, can so, take advantage of yes, this one minute. Go, go um, what is the name of the ceramic duplication process? Yeah. Um, it's the same, it was the same process, just that, um, uh, so I used photogrammetry to photograph the objects and then uh, 3D modeling to create the model, the um, visual model, and then printed them, one with a uh, plastic printer and one with a, a ceramic printer. It's the same process, just um, a clay printer. Thank you. So I think we'll... We'll say thank you to Gabi. This was fabulous. Thank and, you. And thank you, everybody who follows us from home. We're yeah, and hope to see you to, next and, week. And we'll, <laughs> hope that you will see us and we will hear from you next week. Uh, take care. Again, join us next week again for Zooming in from the Magnus. Thank you again, Gabriela Vilens. Thank you. For your work and your words. Goodbye, everyone.